the next session obstructive sleep apnea in children we have two speakers um, uh, first among them is dr shyan vijay shekran who is joining us from australia uh, dr shyan uh, is one of the first um, international uh, fellows who uh, completed his uh, pediatric otolaryngology fellowship under professor robin cotton himself at cincinnati children's usa and uh, he has a lot to his credit but i am just going to Uh, run through these things quickly because we are behind time. Uh, Dr. Shyan provides voluntary medical care at several hospitals in developing nations. He even operates in India from time to time, and he's probably uh, the only one amongst us who volunteers at um, a zoo to treat animals with ENT conditions. Over to you, Dr. Shyan. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, and thank you for inviting me to speak. I'll. Um just going to share my screen um let's see so uh, i'm going to talk about pediatric osa can you hear me can you see my slides etc good you're good great thank you very much so i'll try and uh, catch up some time i've got 20 minutes um the stupid looking lazy child who frequently suffers from headache at school breathes through his mouth instead of his nose um should see the doctor um and this is from 1889 so they worked out about pediatric osa way back then um we just um so why do we have uh, adenotonsal hypertrophy it's probably something to do with your immune system um in children who are um who suffer from adenotonsal hypertrophy uh, we know that they are more likely to be amenose binding lectin deficient that's an uh, innate immune system molecule Uh, this other study Huang et al from 2020 showed that uh, children with tonsil hypertrophy had up re regulation of many of the um innate immune system um uh, molecules including uh, toll like receptor 4 um interleukin alpha and interleukin uh, 1 beta interleukin 7 um and then uh, this is a study from our lab um Tulia Mateus who looked at um nasopharyngeal swabs in children with uh, controls uh, controls to recurrent tonsillitis in OSA and she did quantitative PCR on these um swabs and found that children with OSA had the highest uh quantity of bacteria within their tonsils more than the recurrent tonsillitis and more than the control group which would suggest that um chronic tonsillitis uh, leads to uh, adenotonsil hypertrophy leading to OSA which means that in the future we may have some form of medical therapy for adenotonsil hypertrophy and this is what we uh, look at when we look in the tonsils other things that we found this is from our clinical studies um we found that iron deficiency was much more common um in children with OSA sorry uh, there's a um I'm just going to delete that uh much more common in um children with OSA uh in our study population uh, 34% were iron deficient as opposed to uh, 7 or 8% in the general population so iron deficiency either plays a role in the uh, etiology of adenotonsal hypertrophy or is something that is results as a consequence of this um the international pediatric otolaryngology group um has looked at um objective testing for OSA uh, and has found that um um essentially um in otherwise well children with no comor comorbidities sleep studies are not required uh, whereas those with uh, trisomy 21 and little or have craniofacial anomalies we should do sleep studies so uh, what if you can't get a sleep study which is uh, the current problem um throughout the world uh, access to sleep studies is uh, pretty difficult in which case trying to make a diagnosis um in um children with mild OSA that pediatric sleep questionnaire has a very high sensitivity um as does uh, dan does pulse oximetry or the pulse oximetry has a higher specific a higher specificity than the sleep questionnaire in moderate OSA however the PSQ OSA 18 um and pulse oximetry all exhibit comparable sensitivity so in our world where making a diagnosis of OSA is difficult um with sleep study access um we should be using more sleep questionnaires um so how do we treat pediatric sleep uh, um sleep apnea um the chat study from 2013 much quoted study um showed that um when they looked at children just with mild OSA only um 
in the slightly older group, five to nine years old, uh, where 50% of kids are obese, uh, there was an 85% normalization of sleep studies uh, in the normal, um, the non-comorbid group, 71% in the African-American children, and 67% even in the obese group. They also found reduced enuresis, more REM sleep, and lower blood pressures uh, in the adenotonsillectomy group. The medical therapy group also normalized their sleep studies, but approximately 90% had persistent symptoms on quality of life questionnaires. So what's happening throughout Australia, which is a specific question, um, we have variable rates of adenotonsillectomy depending on where you live in the country. Um, if you live in the middle of the country, which is mainly desert, obviously the, the uh, rates are very low uh, and it's higher in urban centers. Um, the rates of adenotonsillectomy have not changed over time. And when you compare uh, international groups, um, the rates of adenotonsillectomy are, um, are um, highest in wealthier countries with higher GDP per capita and those who have a uh, community based um, uh, or societal regulation of surgery. If you are in a lower um, um, GDP per capita country or you have a highly regulated or um, government controlled access to healthcare, you have lower rates of adenotonsillectomy. So interestingly, even though the United Kingdom and New Zealand are relatively wealthy in terms of GDP per capita. They have lower rates of tonsillectomy uh, as does Sweden compared to comparable countries such as Norway, Luxembourg, the United States, Australia, etc. and Germany. So how do we determine if we're actually doing a good job uh, in treating these patients? Um, patient reported outcome measures uh, in my practice are a very important way of judging the impact of treatment. Um, they're a very valuable support for uh, patient-centered care. So who cares if their sleep study is normal? We really want to know if the patient's happier, are their symptoms better? Um, and systematic collection of patient reported outcome data will help, help improve quality of life, quality and safety of uh, treatment delivery. So uh, ongoing, how do we make diagnoses? We've talked about sleep studies and the poor access using sleep questionnaires uh, preoperatively and, and postoperatively, um, and then um, examination. So um, the International Pediatric Otolaryngology Group looked at um, sleep questionnaires and found that um, 87%, uh, um, there was an 87% sensitivity of diagnosing OSA with the PSQ. Um, and 85% of uh, the experts in this group recommended doing preoperative PSQs, uh, although the majority did not do so. Uh, physical assessment, when we assess children with OSA, uh, the Brodsky score is the most commonly used thing. 96% uh, of um, um, pediatric in, in ENT surgeons in this, this cohort uh, did uh, a Brodsky score, a Malampotti score, uh, maybe only 50%. And occlusion types, interestingly, higher than the Malampati, uh, that class one, two, three occlusion, that was nearly 80%, and 65% use the nasendoscopy routinely. So um, if you're doing pre- and post-operative uh, pediatric sleep questionnaires to assess the outcome, um, does the aforementioned iron deficiency affect your outcome? So we looked at this uh, group of patients, 250 patients roughly, who underwent adenotonsillectomies, um, to treat um, or intracapsular tonsillectomy and anodectomy to treat sleep disorder breathing. Um, and we segregated them into different age cohorts. And what we found was that in most children uh, or in all children, there was improvements in the OSA 18 uh, outcomes, uh, depending on which uh, group uh, of questions you asked, but in general, all of them improved. Um, the only patients who did not have significant improvement in their behavioral outcomes were children under the age of two who were iron deficient with ferritins of less than 20 micrograms per liter. Um, so in summary, if you've got a child who you've treated their OSA, but they've still got daytime irritability, make sure you check their iron levels. And if their iron levels are low, consider supplementation to treat their ongoing symptoms. But when is adenotonsillectomy not enough in terms of fixing the airway obstruction? Um, this occurs in children with persistent nasal obstruction, uh, such as allergic rhinitis, uh, pathology uh, and the level of the pharynx, such as the tongue base or supraglottis. In our practice, the most common cause of failure of um, adenotonsillectomy is nasal obstruction, rhinitis, septal deviation, uh, rarely other nasolacrimal duct cysts and so on. Um, 
In the more complicated patient population, certainly lingual tonsillar hypertrophy, macroglossia and glossoptosis uh, play a role, such as patients with Down syndrome, um, backward vitamin, etc. And in the younger children, Laringa malacia is a cause of ongoing OSA. Needless to say, patients with craniofacial anomalies, such as cleft lip and palate, uh, piraban, sequence, etc., are also more likely to have ongoing symptoms following adenotonsillectomy. So how do you manage these patients? We recommend uh, using a multidisciplinary team, um, doing clinical assessments and nasendoscopy, a sleep study. Uh, and certainly in this group of patients, drug-induced sleep nasendoscopy has become the standard of care. Um, don't forget blood tests to exclude things like ATP, iron deficiency, et cetera, and manage their cardiac or uh, obesity problems. Um, this is our CAT uh, complex airway team, uh, multidisciplinary team um, manager that manages um, children who have persistent OSA following uh, routine surgery. The IPOG group also agreed that uh, MDTs uh, and assessment of comorbidity is an important part of managing children who fail routine surgery such as adenotonsillectomy, uh, and there was 92% agreement on this. Um, a referral to a subspecialist was recommended uh, if they have mild to moderate OSA or severe OSA. Uh, most uh, experts recommended referral to cardiology. Um, uh, interestingly, there are other reasons why people uh, or children may continue to snore following adenotonsillectomy. Uh, passive smoke exposure nearly doubles your risk of OSA um, in, in this patient cohort. And uh, certainly obesity is a, plays a big role. Uh, about 60% of obese children will have OSA, and the majority of um, Children who are obese will have persistent OSA following adenotonsillectomy. And in these patients, we should consider diet, exercise, et cetera, referral to endocrinologist, uh, and in some patients, uh, consider bariatric surgery. Allergic rhinitis, interestingly, both allergic and non-allergic rhinitis are seen uh, in patients with um, uh, OSA, um, and rhinitis is a cause of ongoing OSA uh, in children following surgical intervention as a reference by this um, uh, review of the literature. So how do we treat uh, mild RSA? Um, in, uh, initially, uh, we should not forget the use of uh, Montelukast and intranasal corticosteroids. Uh, the majority of uh, experts in the IPOG um, document uh, recommended a trial at least of Montelukast alone or Montelukast and intranasal, co intranasal corticosteroids. Um, uh, they recommended at least a three month course in children with moderately severe OSA or worse, there is no evidence for medical therapy alone. And in these patients, one should consider surgical intervention uh, in the first instance. Um, how do we treat rhinitis? We've talked about nasal steroids and, uh, and Montelukast, but don't forget uh, turbinant reduction procedures. Um, there are various different types of turbinant reduction procedures that may be employed uh, to reduce turbinant hypertrophy and in these children uh, couldn't play a pivotal role in reducing their OSA. Is there a role for septoplasty in children? Certainly in children with severe septal deviation, a limited septoplasty is considered safe. Um, we should all stay away from the um, uh, areas uh, such as the um, junction of the quadrilateral cartilage and the perpendicular plate where there is a growth plate and the floor of the nose, but limited septoplasty has been shown to be safe in children to treat septal deviation. Uh, what else can you do? Uh, obviously, um, uh, when you do a nasendoscopy, you may see things like this uh, patient with macroglossia, uh, where the tongue is sitting up, up against the retropharyngeal um, structures, or a disease like this, a, a lingual thyroid um, or a thyroglossal duct cyst in the in the tongue base. So, um, nasendoscopy, both awake and asleep, is vital in treating these patients who have ongoing symptoms following routine surgery. Uh, how, how do you do drug-induced sleep nasendoscopy? Um, uh, the most important thing is to have a consistent plan, um, inhalational agent uh, at the uh, beginning, followed by prop propofol or dexamethamidine, uh, and then uh, um, assess the airway adequately. The most commonly used system is called the VOCE system, uh, velum, oropharynx, tongue base, and epiglottis, uh, with a score from zero to three. Um, uh, and when you look at uh, these patients who fail adenotonsillectomy and who have DICE, or in some patients, a CINE uh, MRI, uh, um, m almost half of them will have some form of comorbidity. The majority will be trisomy 21, about approximately 40% will be obese. Uh, 
the tongue base is the most common site of airway obstruction, and lingual tonsillectomy in this meta-analysis was the most common procedure performed. Um, in these patients following DICE-directed surgery, there were some great outcomes with significant reduction in the OAHI. Um, and the conclusion of this meta-analysis that in, is in that complicated patients, DICE or CINE MRI directed surgery results in significant improvements in OAHI. What about CPAP? And certainly CPAP is an option in these patients who failed uh, regular surgery. Um, this meta-analysis looking at uh, the outcomes of CPAP found that adherence was, uh, was around 50 to 60 percent. Um, However, the range was quite large, 24 to 87%. Um, and um, this meta-analysis suggested that we should really look at papers where adherence is uh, up near 90% and see what these patients are um, using as adjuncts to assist with their um, uh, CPAP uh, compliance. However, in patients, even though patients have high rates of, of uh, compliance with CPAP, uh, the average number of hours of CPAP use ranged from four to five hours, um, which would suggest inadequate duration of PAP use, uh, even though there may be high compliance in certain populations. Laryngomalacia is a special cause of uh, airway obstruction, mainly in younger children under the age of one, but you can sometimes see laryngomalacia in teenagers and occasionally adults. Um, in these patients, uh, one should be aware that brainstem pathology, such as anal chiari malformation, may play a role in causing uh, laryngomalacia, and all of these patients should have some form of MRI scan uh, of the posterior fossa to exclude um, an anal chiari or other uh, brainstem pathology. Um, so the, the, the majority of children who we see um, following um, a failed adenotonsillectomy, uh, children like this, a 22-year-old boy with probably 21, persistent OSA following adenotonsillectomy. Um, and most often in these children, the problem lies in the tongue base. Sometimes it's obesity. Um, um, midline posterior glossectomy or lingual tonsillectomy has been proposed as a treatment for children with Down syndrome. Um, and certainly in our practice, this is uh, um, a... a patient population from our institution, a uh, 10 year analysis of uh, pediatric patients under the age of 17 who underwent uh, midline posterior glossectomy. Uh, and what we found uh, was um, in the 20 or so patients we looked at uh, lingual tonsillar hypertrophy uh, and lingual tonsillectomy. Um, and this is a lingual tonsillectomy being performed with a um, EVAC 70 coblation wand. Um, Notice the tonsils um, have been removed in the past. Um, we use an endotracheal tube uh, and use a cablator to do essentially surface diathermy or ablation of the tonsil tissue. Um, or in some patients, a, a midline posterior glossectomy, like this child who was a, a trisomy 21, had a coin latresia repair, cardiac surgery, and severe OSA, bordering on needing a tracheostomy. And uh, what we do in these patients is a midline posterior glossectomy where we um, essentially ablate the uh, tongue base. Um, looks like my computer is frozen, apologies. Um, just gonna move on. Um, and in these patients doing a midline posterior glossectomy, uh, what we found was in children who were not obese, we, had very, we were very successful in reducing the uh, OHI from very high numbers down to zero. Uh, and the children who did not benefit, the red lines here, are the patients who uh, were obese. So in children who are not obese, midline posterior glossectomy is a highly effective procedure at managing obstructive sleep apnea. So um, my conclusions. Uh, in this patient population where um, macroglossia or glossoptosis is a problem, uh, midline posterior glossectomy and lingual tonsillectomy uh, are a good operation in the absence of obesity to treat OSA. Um, surgical intervention uh, is an alternative to positive airway pressure in these children, uh, and it's a safe procedure. What else can you do to treat persistent OSA following adenotonsillectomy? Uh, rapid maxillary expansion um, has been shown to be better than adenotonsillectomy alone. Um, and in this uh, meta-analysis, uh, what they found um, was in the majority of children, uh, if they had persistent OSA following adenotonsillectomy or had OSA with small tonsils and adenoids, um, once you've excluded other signs of obstruction, such as the tongue base or the epiglottis, um, 
uh, and a, a rapid mixer expansion um, is an effective way of managing OSA. Mandibular advancement, this can be um, performed with uh, appliances alone, uh, and this is shown to be um, somewhat effective um, in treating uh, OSA, although uh, mandibular advancement surgery is much more effective, especially in children who have retrognathia associated with syndromes such as Raban sequence, uh, where you see massive improvements um, uh, on, on in this meta-analysis. The mean improvement was from 41 uh, events per hour to four and a half events per hour with significant improvement in oxygen saturation. So in the appropriate patient, mandibular advancement surgery is a um, procedure of choice. Back to the IPOG um, statement or consensus, consensus statement, um, the, the group of experts uh, assessed uh, recommended in malocclusion that 100% of patients should be referred to an orthodontist if they had a craniofacial anomaly, a 90%, a narrow palate 90%, and if there's persistent mouth breathing after nasal surgery, 80% should see an orthodontist. Um, they also agreed that a trial of Monte Lucast um, should be recommended in the majority of children um, and uh, recommended in the majority of cases at least a three month trial. Uh, that did, however, always recommend adenotonsillectomy as the first treatment option in children with OSA aged 2 to 18 who are otherwise uncomplicated uh, and without comorbidities. Um, children under the age of 2 or obese were still uh, highly uh, supported. To, to have an adenotonsillectomy as the first option. Uh, in trisomy 21, once again, the majority of the IPOG group recommended adenotonsillectomy first up. In cranial facial disorders, 75% recommended an adenotonsillectomy. Uh, in this group, they recommended, uh, in the majority of cases, uh, overnight admission in kids under the age of two, those with cranial facial disorders, obesity, or moderately severe OSA, and day case surgery in children with an OHI under five, no com comorbidities, um, or uh, older than two. What's new? Um, uh, potentially, hypoglossal nerve stimulators uh, may become uh, ubiquitous uh, in treating children with macroglossia or glossoptosis. Certainly, there have been trials in teenagers um, with, with some success, and there is a multi center study going on currently um, looking at OSA um, uh, resistant to adenotonsillectomy. So in summary, um, in the failed uh, OSA uh, adenotonsillectomy group, 15% in non-obese patients, higher risk groups, we should correct nasal obstruction, we should do a multidisciplinary assessment, we should consider uh, DICE-directed surgery, consider laryngomalacia, tongue-based pathology, don't forget referral to an orthodontist or orthognathic surgeon, and in the future, we may be considering uh, hypoglossal stimulation. Thank you very much for your time and the invitation to speak to you today. Thank you, Professor Xian.